And there's plenty of seats at the front. Honest, we won't pick on you. Oh, awesome. Hey, have you, have you ever noticed, like, we, you, you, might have, you, you might not have realized this consciously, but every single moment, almost nearly every single moment of every single day, you are invited to believe something. You've done it already today, and you probably didn't even realize it. You got here this morning, and if you got yourself a hot drink, you, you went to a flask, and you pressed the button because you believed that there was something in there, even though you hadn't actually done that today. Maybe you've done it previously, or maybe this is your first time with us, and, and you just did it. You just believed that there was going to be hot water in there. You, were gonna believe, you believed that it was what it said it was. If you grabbed yourself one of the bottles of water, you believed that what was in it was what it said. When you got here and you saw these chairs, you actually believed that that chair was strong enough to hold the weight of your body. And we do it all the time. We do it naturally. We just do it all the time. Now, you did it because of your experience and because of the evidence. So your experience was you probably saw other people getting drinks and you might have seen some water coming out and maybe you've done it before. Maybe you did it a few weeks ago. Maybe you did it last time you were with us. And and then you have the evidence of seeing other people doing it. You have the experience of having sat in a chair before. You have the experience of knowing that that chair looks stable. You know, there's four legs. It's not like, you know, wonky or broken. It it looks stable. And maybe this is this chair that you're sitting on. Maybe today is the first day. Think about it because it's possible the chair that you're sitting on right now, this is the first time you have ever sat in that exact chair. Because there's lots of chairs in this room, they all look the same, and they all get moved around. And how do you know that the one that you're sitting on right now is the one that you've ever sat on before? You just believe that it would hold your weight, and it's based on your experience and your evidence. And let's be honest, that's how we believe anything in life. Now, today is Easter Sunday, and in your house, as in mine, you might have got some chocolate. Now, based on lots of experience, I believe that it has inside this box what it says is on the outside, right? I mean, you know, I've got years of experience and I'm happy to road test any of your boxes that look like this that you got today. Just bring them to me and I will be happy to look after them for you. If you need somebody with experience who has enough evidence to believe that what is inside here is what it says. Now, you might even meet a colleague or maybe, um, maybe if you're at university or school, you might, you might see somebody in a couple days and you're going you're gonna to say this to them, how was your Easter holiday? And they're going to say to you, it was great, it was rubbish, weather was good, weather was crap. I don't know what they're going to say. They're going to say, that's probably what they're going to say, those types of things. Or they're going to say, hey, we went abroad, we went to Turkey for two weeks. And you didn't go with them because you were stuck here but you're invited to believe that what they're telling you is true, even though you didn't do it. You were never there. You were not with them, but you're gonna believe that what they're telling you is true. And here's why, because of experience and evidence. That's the only reason we believe things. You have experience of that person because you've worked with them for a number of years and you know what they're like. They're pretty trustworthy. You also have the experience of, you know, being quite jealous because they go away every second they get a chance to and you quite don't like them for that. No, I'm kidding. So, and you've got the, the evidence, like they, maybe they've got a tan, and you know it doesn't smell like saint Tropez. You know it's like a real one, okay? And the thing is, like, they're showing you their photographs, and it's on their Insta, or it's on their Snap, and they're showing you what they've just been doing. And all of a sudden, because of the experience and the evidence, you believe, even though you were not there yourself, and you did not have the same experience yourself, you still believe it. Because everybody is invited to believe something every single day. And it's the same for every single one of us. Every single one of us only believes something because of experience and because of evidence. That's all it is. It's the truth, isn't it? It really, really is the truth. And today is Easter Sunday, as we know. And the first followers of Jesus, it was the same for them. They only believed that Jesus was who he claimed to be because he made an outlandish claim claims, I should say, because of their experience and because of their evidence that they experienced. And, and if you, if you, if you kind of doubt it, then I would say you are in absolutely the best place. 
Because you are in the same place that every single one of Jesus' first followers were. Every single one of his first followers were skeptics and doubters and did not believe the unbelievable and unexpected event that took place. So if that's where you're at today, you are in the best place possible because you are at the same starting point for every single person who has ever had questions about Jesus, including his closest friends and his family members, every single one of them. So if you're skeptical, welcome to the club. If you're a doubter, it's great to be together. If you have questions, awesome. So do we. This is where we are because we are all in the same position, the same place. And something happened to turn his closest friends and family members from skeptics into doubters. So what in the world happened? What in the world was it? And maybe you've heard this story a lot of times because you grew up in church and this is something that you've heard so much that it's almost like the story they tell you at Christmas when Father Christmas comes or the Easter Bunny. It's just sort of something that we do as a, as a rhythm or a ritual and sort of you just kind of, you've just heard the story so many times that it doesn't actually mean anything other than it's just a story to you. And maybe you already know the end of the story where we're going to go this morning. I get that because maybe you've heard it before. But I want to look at why this story is even important to us. Why is it even important to you? Why did it do such a thing for the first followers of Jesus to change them from skeptics and doubters into believers. And John writes this letter. Here's what John writes. He writes this and he says, that which we have heard and seen with our own eyes, that which we have looked at, that which we have touched with our own hands, the experience and the evidence This we proclaim about the word of life. The life appeared and we have seen it and we testify to it. So we're sharing our experience just like your friend or your colleague at school or at work tomorrow is going to tell you or Tuesday is going to tell you all about their Easter holiday. They're testifying about it. They've seen it and they're testifying it. And John's saying, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. Why? Why? Because he's like that colleague of yours who wants to rub it in your face that they go on holiday and you don't? No. They want to share it with you so you can share it with them. You see, see, it's a different motivation, isn't it? They're telling you this. This is my experience and this is the evidence. We've seen it. We've tasted it. we've, We've touched it with our own hands so that you can share it with us. I want to share the experience with you. They want to share it with you because, because it's, it's so big. It's so monumental that it's something that can't just stay for them. This is why it's important for all of us because it's not just for them. It's for everyone. They want to share it. This is the fellowship. And this is so cool. Now, what changed them from skeptics and doubters into believers? Because just like the humanist professor... Um, Alice Roberts tweeted last year on Good Friday, she tweeted this tweet, which was this, which is this. Dead people don't come back to life. And you know what? You and I totally agree with her. Okay, let's not be offended. Let's totally agree. Because haven't you had enough heartache in your own life to know that somebody you love didn't come back? I was there. I watched my mom die. We had a stillborn child. I don't want to get, I don't want to turn this into a depressing moment, but but my experience and my evidence is that what she is saying is absolutely 100% true. Dead people don't come back to life. They don't. Right? That's your experience. You know it's true. I know it's true. We all know it's true because this is what, this is what we experience. But something happened on that first Easter to totally convince people of something different. Why did these first followers of Jesus think that he was more than just a good teacher? Why did they think he was more than just a great guy, a moral philosopher, a social activist? Why did they think he was more than just sort of political? You know, why did they think he was more than just some rebel, some sort of 
holy anarchist? Why did they think he was more than that? Why did they think he was more than just a lunatic? Because to make the claims he claimed, you'd have to be an idiot, okay? You, you just have to be a fool. Something must have happened for them to still be believing that he was actually the son of God. Something must have happened because Jesus came back from the dead. There's only one event that explains anything logically. You see, if there was no resurrection, there would be no story. Without the resurrection, here's why. Jesus would have been just another one of those Jewish teachers, which they called them rabbis in that day. It just means the teacher. Without the resurrection, Jesus just would have been another Jewish rabbi that got killed by the Jewish authorities. There's plenty of verifiable historical evidence of the religious leaders of that time putting to death a number of other rabbis. It's not an unusual thing to happen in history. Everybody agrees. Even Richard Dawkins would agree, okay? Let's just be really clear. Everybody would agree. And the other thing as well, without the resurrection, Jesus would have just been another punk. He just would have been another rebel that got in the way. And another guy that got put to death on a cross. One of the most famous events. Spartacus, right? He looks a bit like me. Just kidding. <laughs> right? <laughs> you might have seen the movies. Spartacus, yeah, he led the slave rebellion. 70 years before Jesus, and then 6,000 of the soldiers. Do you, maybe you know this story. They got, they, they got defeated. Anyway, Rome defeated them. 6,000 of the troops were crucified all along the road to Rome. You see, without the resurrection, Jesus would have been just another dumb punk that got in the way of the system that they put to death and forgot about. Without the resurrection, he would have been just another religious leader that was in the way that they got rid of. But for some reason, we still talk about him. For some reason, people were inspired to start universities because of him. For some reason, people were inspired to start social reform plans. People are inspired to start businesses. People are inspired to do something about their lives for somebody else. And we're doing it because of some dude that lived thousands of years ago. So if, like why, like why? Unless something happened, why in the world are we even talking about him? Right, I mean, let's be honest. You ever thought about that? Why? You know, John, who this guy that we've been looking at this whole series, writes the record of, of what took place at the end of Jesus' life. And we're going to look at it in just a moment. And John writes his eyewitness account of the crucifixion, of the whole sort of last moments. And it, and it starts like this. He writes in John 19, he says this, carrying his own cross, and he's talking about Jesus here. He says, carrying his own cross, he goes to the place of the skull. If you're looking for a death metal band name, I think that's a good one. You could take it. Um, the place of the skull, uh, uh, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him along with two others, one on each side. So John's an eyewitness, and he's writing to people who lived at that time. And you notice that John doesn't have to tell you. So what they do at a crucifixion is they get the guy, they put him back, they put one arm this way, and then they nail it, and then they get the other arm, and they put it up, and they nail it. Do you know why he doesn't have to tell you what it is? Because you already know what it is. Because he's writing to people who lived at a time when they would all know what a crucifixion was. So John does not give us details about the crucifixion. John gives us details that only an eyewitness would know, like who was there with Jesus, what conversations took place at the end, what was happening at the end. John doesn't need to go into details and tell you about the type of wood or how many nails they used because you know what a crucifixion is. He's just writing to people who know what a crucifixion is. When John was writing his memoirs, he was not expecting us to be thinking about this or reading his book thousands of years later. He just wrote down his eyewitness account. There was no Bible when John wrote his book. See, John writes this. He says, near the cross stood his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. He starts listing the people who were there. And John was there too. He calls himself the disciple who Jesus loved. He says this. He goes on and he says that um, when Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple who he loved nearby, he said to her, woman, this is your son. And he said to him, here's your mother. 
And from that day on, the disciple took her into his home. John calls himself the disciple who Jesus loved five times. He wasn't loved more than others, but John has this thing about love. He's the same guy that wrote, for God so loved the world. He's the same guy that wrote, if you don't love that which you can with the person that you can see, how can you even imagine that you could love something that you can't see? This is the same guy. He had a thing about love. Here's why he had a thing about love. His entire identity was changed because he realized the only thing that I can say about myself, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. That's my entire identity, my security, my, my being, my place. Jesus loves me. That's why he calls himself the disciple who Jesus loved. It's not an arrogant boast. It's just, man, I am the sinner saved by grace. I am the one Jesus loved. We're all the ones Jesus loved. That's, it's not a title he takes exclusively. Just in case you had any questions about why he uses a funny name to call himself, right? Because it would be, seem a bit weird for us to do that nowadays, wouldn't it? But anyway, you get the point. So he, carry, he carries on. And then Jesus cries out, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. You see, John is an eyewitness to the event. That's why John is recording the things that he saw and experienced. That's why he's giving us details about these types of things. Not the crucifixion itself. He's giving us details about the person and the people that were there. And he cries out, it is finished. And Jesus didn't cry. He cries out like it is finished, like it's just, I've done it. Yeah, it's a victor's cry. It is done. Yeah. And John carries on. He gives us details about like when all of this is happening. Look at this. John writes next, he says this, he says, it was the day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. We've talked about this a few times in this series. Jesus did so many stuff around these events and festivities. And if you've missed any, you can jump online, go on the YouTube channel, and you can catch some of the previous messages. But the Sabbath was really important to these people and the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. So they asked the soldiers to break their legs and take the bodies down. (laughs) <laughs> hey, let's pause there okay that's freaking gruesome that's horrible yeah yeah if you think it's Christians and because they believe in Jesus they've given the world a bad name uh uh-uh. uh it's people who are religious leaders who take violence to justify their means and I'm sorry maybe, maybe in your life you've had somebody who said they were a Christian and if they're hurting you and if they're doing things which are damaging they're not acting like Jesus because Jesus himself was damaged by religious people who used violence to justify their means and if you've had that experience in church if you've had that experience in life I'm really sorry for you and that's nothing like Jesus okay that's people that are using religion to abuse power So don't throw out Jesus just because you've had a bad experience because somebody was a religious idiot. I've made a few bad choices with my money, but let me tell you this, I still use money. Okay? So just because you had one bad experience because of one idiot, please, please don't write off the whole Jesus thing. Because here we have religious leaders saying, eh, we don't want to get our hands dirty. It's a special day. We can't have dead bodies. And they're going to do something as gruesome as breaking the legs of people hanging on a cross. How do you think it happened? I mean, I mean what, just think about it. Okay, this is a violent, despicable act in the name of maintaining religion. And that is not the way Jesus treats you. In fact, it's the way Jesus himself was treated. So I'm just moving on again. Sorry. It's a, bit, it's a bit of an aside. So the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first man. And then they broke the legs of the other. But when they came to Jesus, they found he was already dead. And so they didn't need to break his legs. He was, he was already gone. Okay, who tells us these things? An eyewitness. Who includes these details? An eyewitness. Who was there? John was there. This is why he writes his eyewitness account. And then there's this little phrase, this verse that you might have read and you might have just run straight over it because it just sort of, it doesn't seem to fit. And it says this, it says, the man who saw it has given testimony. His testimony is true and he tells you the truth so you may also believe. He, he's like, 
This is what really happened. And I'm telling you so you can believe this is what really happened. He's not talking about the resurrection, okay? Right? He's talking about the dude is dead. He's talking about the guy was gone. Gone. He's talking about, I'm taking care of his mother now. He's talking about Jesus cried out, it is finished. He's talking about, it's over. The guy, I saw it with my own eyes. He was dead. Dead. Gone. Okay? He's gone. And it's like he's reaching through. Just, just imagine this. I mean, it's like John is writing to us now. Isn't that crazy? It's, here we are reading this narrative, and all of a sudden he breaks the narrative to say, Hey, the man who's writing this, his testimony is true, so you can believe it. He's like writing to us thousands of years later. It's like, oh my gosh, he's, he's actually writing to those who are going to read his book. He had no idea that people that would read his book would be us. And he had no idea. But he's like reaching through time and space, and he's like, you can believe it because I was there. I saw it, and this is true. This is my evidence and experience. Remember, that's how we believe everything. Everybody is invited to believe something every day. This is John's experience, and this is John's evidence. And you know what you can say to that? You can say, yeah, I believe that. I believe he was put to death. Maybe he was just a rabbi, just a crazy teacher, and they killed him because he was in the way. That's totally cool. You can believe that. Maybe you believe he was just a punk rebel that got in the way, and the system wanted to kill him. Maybe you can believe that too. And what happens next is that all of these people actually believed what the professor says when dead people don't come back to life. Because what they did next was what you do for a dead body. Here's how it goes. It says, Jesus' body is taken down by this guy named Joseph of Arimathea. We've talked about before names and places. You know, just like a journalist needs to make sure their sources are correct. Joseph from Arimathea had a garden, had a tomb. They took the body down. They wrapped his body in linen. They, they treated it with spices according to the customs. They had to get it done quickly, and they put him in this tomb, and they put a stone over the entrance, and that is what you do for a dead body. They did not expect the guy to do anything other than stay dead. That's what you do for a dead person. Well, the story didn't stop there. Because we know that the disciples spent the weekend in hiding, and they were upset, and they were all... You know, you know, just grieving and shocked. And I don't know. I mean, the world ended. The world changed. Everything changed. Everything that they thought was going to go one way just went south and went the other way. And it's early Sunday morning, and then something begins to happen. So it says it's early in the morning, and Mary Magdalene goes down to the tomb, and it's still dark. You know, maybe she went to the tomb in the dark because th these people are hiding. They're, they're, they don't know what the authorities are going to do to them. And she goes there, and she sees that the stone has been taken away from the entrance. Uh, and she does not know what's going on. And she comes running to Simon Peter and John, the one who Jesus loved. There he goes, calling himself that again. And she says, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Okay, she was not sitting there waiting for Jesus to come back to life. The first possible moment that she could go and pay her respects, she goes to the grave, and she finds it desecrated. That's what she's thinking. Okay, she is freaking out. She's got no idea what's going on, and she doesn't come back and tell them, Woohoo! Yeah, we are champions! Yes, we are! Yes, I told you all you had to do is believe it by faith, and yes, you can do anything. Yes, 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 yes. No, they weren't like something trying to pump you up. She was disappointed and despondent because she has no idea where they've taken his body. She has no idea what's going on. It's early in the morning, doo -doo 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 -doo, banging on the door. She's freaking out, and she does not assume for a moment that Jesus has come back to life. And why is John telling us these kind of things? Because he's telling you how it happened. He's telling you his eyewitness account. He's not to prove some extra point. He's just telling you what occurred. This is how it happened, because none of us believed it. None of us expected it. And then here's what happens next. They run off to the tomb. You know, they don't portray themselves as heroes. They don't, they don't write about themselves as great men of faith who didn't doubt for a moment that Jesus was ever coming back. No, they just, they like, they go running to the tomb as well. So they head off and they go running down to the tomb. And John adds this funny little detail. So it says, Peter and the other disciple ran to the tomb. 
But the other disciple got there first. <laughs> I was faster than Peter. <laughs> Peter stopped for some breakfast. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe Peter had shorter legs. I don't know. Maybe Peter had a, I don't know. Anyway, so John gets there first, yeah? He bent over. So John's at the entrance of the tomb. He bent over and he saw the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. John tells us that he got there first because he wants us to know that he didn't go in the tomb. John got there first, and he, he looks in, and he sees what's happened. And, and for whatever reason, I don't know whether he was afraid, whether he just was, like, hesitant, whether he balked, whether he just was, like, it's, a, like, the grave. I don't know. Like, I don't know why he didn't go in. But all of a sudden, Peter just poof, bulldozes straight in. Peter arrived and went straight in. Poof, he just goes straight in to the tomb, which is where, like, a dead body should have been. Okay? It's just funny how they write about it. So... Honestly, and Peter saw the strips of cloth lying there. And we will too in just a moment. Peter saw the strips of cloth lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, (laughs) the other disciple went in. So John's like, okay, Peter's done it. It's okay, it's safe. I can come in as well, right? So then Peter, Peter comes in as well, which is crazy. But just imagine the scene. They have spent the weekend having the worst weekend of their lives. And, and, and Peter, actually, a couple days ago, swore that he never met Jesus before in his life. This guy that publicly said three times, I don't know Jesus. I don't know who he is. He denied him. He denied him. He denied him. This guy is the first one to rush into the tomb to see what's going on. I mean, imagine the guilt and the shame. I don't know what he was carrying. You know, I don't know what he expected to find. Maybe, maybe he stopped to pick up a sword. Maybe he stopped to pick up a big stick. Maybe he stopped because when you read about the life of Peter, you read about this guy who's like, like, you know, he just seems to have this, like, just this, I don't know, it's just this rough for life, you know what I mean? If I, was in a, if I was in a fight, I'd want Peter on my side. Let's just say that. We don't know why Peter stopped, but Peter's like, somebody's taking the body, and I'm going to find out who it is. We, we don't know. I'm speculating here, but what kind of weekend do they have? Have you, have you ever cried so much that you can't cry anymore? You ever had one of those moments in life where, where you had so much hope so much expectation, so much longing, so much desire for something to work out, and it didn't work out. And it, maybe it caught you totally blindsided, like maybe you found out your partner was having an affair. Maybe you thought this marriage was over. After all these years, it was going to be so great, and then it wasn't. And maybe you found out this job that you thought was, was set for life and going to work out for life just didn't work out. Or maybe, maybe you got news, unexpected news, that a really close person you loved, gone. You have one of those moments in life, one of those, it happens to all of us at different times. You have one of, and this is what it was like for these disciples. They had a moment that started out one way in the morning, but by that evening, everything was different now. That's the place that they were in emotionally. They were hiding out. They were frightened. They were, they were stuck away in a place, and they're woken up early in the morning because a distraught woman is banging on the door. <laughs> Somebody has stolen the body. What would your reaction be? What would your emotions be like? Maybe they ran down there hoping Mary got it wrong. Maybe they ran down there hoping Mary's deluded. Maybe they ran there hoping she found the wrong tomb or something. I, I, we don't know. And they survey the scene. And why is this detail important? Because if you're going to steal the body, this is not what you do. It's simply that. If you're going to steal the body, you don't, like, unwrap it first and then fold the cloth and put it on the side. That would be such a waste of time. Such a, such a waste of time. If you're going to nick a body, I think you do it as quickly and efficiently as possible. I've never done it, by the way. Okay, but I'm just saying, hypothetically, if I was going to steal a dead body, I would not wait to unwrap it and then fold the cloth and put it in a certain place and put the other one. Okay, I would not do that, right? I don't think you would either. I think we would be in and out as quickly as possible. And if I was with somebody else who started to unwrap a dead body, I'd be like, leave it wrapped. We are going. Take the corpse and run, right? Think about it, okay? So the reason John includes this detail is because he's saying, look, They didn't steal the body. 
But we have no clue. We have no clue what's going on. I mean, it's beginning to dawn on them that something unexpected and unbelievable has taken place. But this is what John writes next. This is what he says. He actually says, they, i.e. Peter and John, still did not understand that Jesus had to rise from the dead, okay? They are not sitting there having a mini like boogie in the tomb, yeah? He didn't get out his like phone and start flicking over to Spotify and saying, party for dead people playlists, right? I mean, they're not having a party here. John says, we still do not understand. We, we, we don't understand. They haven't seen anything yet. They don't, they're not sitting here thinking, hey. They believe something happened, but they don't know what happened. They don't know what's going on. And that's why I say to you, if you're a skeptic, if you're a doubter, if you have questions, you are in the most perfect place because every single one of these people had doubts and had questions, and they did not expect a dead person to come back to life because dead people do not come back from the dead. We have experience and evidence to know that. We know that. Okay, and they don't know what's going on. And so they leave, and they go back to where they were staying. Now imagine that conversation. Right? I mean, everybody's awake now, right? Peter and John run off, and then they come back. We don't know where Mary was, but you find out in another book, actually. You can, so you can find out what happened with her. So Peter and John come back. I'm like, what do they tell the others? Yeah? Well, yes, yeah, body's not there. Um, but it wasn't stolen either. Because... It wasn't stolen because of the way the linens were left and everything was right. So I mean, imagine that awkward conversation. Yeah, yeah, they don't know the answers. They still have questions, okay? They, they were not sitting there waiting, counting down the days, the moments, the minutes when Jesus was going to come back to life. They weren't, they weren't sitting there doing that. It doesn't say that they came rushing back to tell everybody else, ooh, Jesus is alive. They didn't do that because they didn't know. They had no idea what was going on at this point. And you can read through the other biographies. There's a number of books. They're called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're books that write about the life of Jesus. And Matthew, Mark, and John are eyewitness accounts about their life. And Luke was a bit different. Luke was a doctor who ex examined and explored all the details. And then he wrote them down for us to be able to trust them ourselves. Luke was like an investigative journalist, if you like. And you can read about other people's experiences when Jesus came back to life and he met with the disciples and a great, amazing thing that happened with Mary who I just told you a moment ago. But John moves on and John carries on and a bit later he actually looks specifically at an episode that took place with one of their closest friends and this guy was named Thomas and Thomas was one of the 12 original disciples, apostles, those words just mean follower okay the disciples just means follower so Jesus was the teacher these guys were the followers so they were these followers and they'd given up everything to be a follower and Thomas was one of these close friends close followers yeah so think about this you've got a close circle of friends I, I, I hope and it might be two people maybe your close circle is only two people maybe your close circle is four people maybe your close circle is a dozen people that's a big circle okay <laughs> Uh, imagine you've got a, a group of you guys that hang out together, a group of you, you usually your close friends that you guys spend time with. And all of you have had this experience, but one of the guys just wasn't there when it happened. One of these girls wasn't there when it happened. One of your friends wasn't there when it took place. And so Thomas wasn't there when everything happened. Thomas missed it. And everybody else has been telling Thomas, mate, we, dude, this is exactly how it happened. We keep telling you this. They're saying to Thomas, we've seen Jesus, because by this point, we've jumped ahead on the story, but by this point, these guys have all had an experience where Jesus appeared to them, but Thomas wasn't there. So they're like, Thomas, you've got to believe it. Thomas, you, you're never going to believe, you're never going to believe what happened. And Thomas says, you're right, I am never going to believe what happened, because dead people stay dead. Dead people stay dead. It's that simple. And, and Thomas says this thing, which is so cool, because Thomas knows that every single one of us, still today, we need experience and evidence to even believe. Thomas says this. Thomas says, unless I can see the nail marks in his hands, unless I can touch the wounds, feel his side where he was hit by the, the spear, I will not believe. Because... 
We all know you need experience and evidence to believe. We do. That's the way it works. I want hard evidence. And this is what John records. And then John writes, a week later, the disciples were in the house again. So all of you and your friends are together again. Your mates are there. You've gathered together. All of you are together. And this time Thomas is there. And even though the doors were locked, which is really cool, Jesus suddenly appeared. He was like Dr. Strange. You know, he did one of those like circles and like walked. No, I don't know. I'm just kidding. So like all of a sudden, like Jesus is there and he's like, peace be unto you, which is old fashioned speak for don't freak out. That's all it means. Like don't freak out because you would freak out if some dude appeared and the doors were locked. The crazy thing is I don't know what doors you've got in your life. I don't know what barriers you've got built up. Whatever you've got that you have locked because of whatever experience you've had, whatever doors, whatever things you've put up in your life because people have been rude to you or unkind or maybe life has just hurt you. Whatever thing you have built, whatever locks you have in place, this guy can move through every single lock that you have put in place. Every single barrier. And he steps into that place and he says, Thomas, Don't freak out. Here, Thomas, it's all right. You can actually touch me. You can can feel my hands. Feel where the nails were. Feel the scars. And what I love about this story, which it doesn't really, it doesn't say this, but, but you can get this feeling. Jesus doesn't tell him off because he doubted. Jesus doesn't say to him, come on, man. Why didn't you believe when all your friends were telling you All of your friends who love you and care for you, all of your family members have been telling you for this, about this event, and you didn't believe. Come on. Like, I mean, Jesus could have shown up and been like, and Peter would have been like, told ya. Right? Okay, that's what would have happened in my circle of friends, okay? Man, idiot. Right. I mean, but Thomas is like not treated that way. Jesus meets Thomas in his doubt, in his skepticism, in his unbelief, in his locked doors. He meets him in the place that Thomas is in and he doesn't berate Thomas. He doesn't say that Thomas is a fool. He doesn't say Thomas should have done something differently. He says to Thomas, it's okay, put your hands here. Because Jesus knows he needed to experience something. He needed the experience and the evidence. He knows that. Yeah, and I don't, know your, I don't know your perception of faith and what God's like and what religion's like, and maybe religion in your life is people that hurt other people, and that's nothing like it should be. And maybe your understanding, your perception of what Jesus is like is the guy that shows up and just tells you off. Maybe your understanding or expectation of what Jesus is like is Jesus is this guy that shows up and points out how many mistakes you've got and tells you off for being a doubter or a skeptic or an unbeliever or a failure. None of that happened. And I'm sorry if you've ever had those experiences before, but if you read the eyewitness accounts, that's not what Jesus is like. It's not what Jesus is like. Jesus is so different than what we expected, so different than what we expected and then, what happens? What's Thomas's response? He just falls to his knees, man. He's just like, my Lord and my God. At some point, it has to become personal. At some point, this story becomes something more than just a concept or an idea or a thing that you've heard your whole life. At some point, this story becomes personal. My Lord, my God. And maybe your experience is going to be it takes a bit longer for you to reach that point, but at some point you will have that challenge in your life to make it personal. Maybe today is the day when you're going to make a decision and make it personal. Maybe today's that day. Maybe it's not. But I'm telling you now, at some point in your life, you make that decision, and it's the biggest decision you can ever make. Make And Thomas says, my Lord, my God, it's that all-in moment. 
And then, again, it's like, just like John did earlier, Jesus says something which is like reaching through time and space, reaching through the ages. And Jesus says this to Thomas. He says, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Because Jesus knows he ain't going to be around forever. These disciples are also not going to be around forever. Right? They're not. And it's like he reaches through time. And then, here's that verse that we have been doing every single day. For this series, we've been looking at this verse, and this is where John writes it. At this point, John says, Jesus did many other signs in front of others that are not written in this book. This book, was, remember, is the book of John. It's not the Bible. It's the book of John. And over the last six weeks, we've been doing a series looking at this verse. And every single week, we've used this verse. Jesus did many other signs in front of others that are not written in this book, but these signs are written so that you may believe. I said at the beginning, in the very first session of this series, we said that John is doing this like summing up statement. He's doing this like summary. He's like wrapping up his whole book, if you like. And this is how he wraps up his whole book. I've written all these things. These are signs to point the way for you. And these signs are written so that you may believe Jesus is the Son of God. And why in the world is that important for you to believe? Because John wants you to have life in his name. At the beginning of John's book, he wrote that verse that we know so well. You might have heard it before. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not die but have life. Life. Everlasting life. John wants to share this experience with you, not to rub it in your nose or tell you off. Not to make you feel like you're an outsider and it's just for insiders. He wants to share it. He said before at the very beginning, it's to share it for the fellowship so you can share in this life. He wants to share it so we can all have a life, a life where you begin to learn that you can say, Jesus loves me. In spite of all my mistakes, in spite of all my failures, in spite of all my screw-ups, in spite of all the times I've not quite got it right, and times I didn't believe, and times I've doubted, and times I messed up, and times I this, and times I've failed again and again and again, you can say with confidence and freedom, I'm the one Jesus loves. That's a totally new way to live your life. Can you just imagine living your life with a security that isn't based on your paycheck, your salary that comes in? Can you imagine living your life in such a way that it's not based on how many friends or how many followers you have on social media? Can you imagine living in such a way where your life is not driven by how much of an education you have or how much money you make or how good looking you are? Can you imagine living that way? Can you imagine living in such a way that that all of your past mistakes aren't hanging on you like massive boulders or like a caboose on the back of a train that just follow you everywhere? Can you imagine living in such a way that that stuff has been cut off and no longer affecting you? Can you imagine living that way? This is why John says it's important to know that the unexpected, unbelievable event actually did happen. And our experience and our evidence is this. Jesus rose from the dead. We saw it. We touched it. We were there and we experienced it. And we want you to experience it too because I want you to have the life that I know is possible. And this is why they thought Jesus was something more than just a great teacher or a social reformer or a moral politician. This is why they believed his outlandish claims. He said he was the son of God. He said he was going to be put to death and he said he was going to come back to life. And then he pulled it off. Which if if one of your friends tells you, I'm going to get killed and then I'm going to come back to life and then they actually do it, you'd probably wake up and take notice, wouldn't you? He made outlandish claims, 
and they believed it. And John wants everyone who reads his eyewitness account to be able to also believe, believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And John's not telling you what to believe, he's just inviting you, because everybody is invited to believe every day. Everybody's invited to believe something every day. And we don't follow, maybe, maybe you think we follow this stuff because the Bible says, it's not because the Bible says. It's because John says. John wrote this. John's experience. The Bible didn't exist at this time. And, and I want you to consider this because none of the early followers believed. And just listen to this list. None of the early followers believed Jesus because of unsubstantiated rumors. They, they didn't believe. They needed evidence and experience. And there's this guy named Matthew. He was a first century follower of Jesus. And he writes his first hand account of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. There's a Greek guy. His name was Mark, good friends of Peter. And he wrote down the Gospel of Mark, which was Peter's story. And he writes down their first hand experience. The same Peter that ran into the tomb. That same Peter who ran into the tomb right later on wrote letters to early churches telling people that the very thing that we have confidence about is just because Jesus came back to life. That's the only thing they testified as confidence. A doctor named Luke traveled all around the ancient world and he investigated the stories and he investigated the reports and he gathered them and he compiled them in one of his Books And you write about his first experience. See, I don't believe because the Bible says. I believe because Matthew and Mark and Peter and John and Luke. I don't believe because the Bible says. I believe because this story tells me about a woman named Mary Magdalene, about a woman named Mary, the mother of Jesus, about a woman named Mary Clopas, the wife of Clopas, and Mary, the mother of James and John. There's a lot of Marys. And you know what? There's historical evidence to say from that time and other ancient sources that Maria was one of the most popular names in the first century. That's why there's a lot of people named Mary because a lot of people were named Mary at that time. And did you know, some of you know this, but did you know you couldn't include a woman as a witness in these types of things? And the very fact that named women, there's Joanna, the, who was named by name in more than one place. She's one of the people that worked in Herod's household. These people are given names. They're honored. They're given names. They're named people. Why would you name somebody who's not a valid witness unless it's actually the truth? The first people to see and the first people to believe and the first people to testify were women. These women, this guy named Paul who hated Jesus and he hated Jesus' followers so much so that he would arrest them and put them into prison and kill them, put them to death. This guy, Paul, had an incredible encounter with Jesus which changed everything about his life and he then spent the rest of his life sharing what Jesus was like. So we believe not because the Bible says so. Because when you get to university and when you get to college, someone's going to say to you, well, if this verse says this and this verse says this, then how can the Bible be true? Okay, it's a valid point. But I didn't believe in Jesus because of that. I believe in Jesus because every single one of these eyewitnesses never changed their story. And they didn't change their story for 40 years. And they didn't write it together collectively. They wrote it individually. And it's only in time that we put them together. Because the Bible wasn't the Bible at the time. I believe because of these people, these people who give us evidence and experience, and these people who lived and died because of their belief. I want you to just imagine for me, some of you have to imagine this, and some of you can imagine it very easily. Imagine when you were younger, you went on a holiday, and you might have done something that you shouldn't have done. Maybe you had a bit too much to drink, and you copped off with some girl somewhere, and, and then you didn't want anybody else to know about it when you got back, Right? Now, just imagine that the four friends that you went with are sat down and they're being investigated and they're being interviewed because somebody has heard that something happened and they want to know what happened. Would any of your friends actually be able to not spill what happened? Or maybe by the time you get back to England, it's already been put on social so everybody knows it happened anyway. None of these guys, none of these women changed their story the entire rest of their lives. So I believe because they believed. I believe because their experience, 
I believe because they believed and they wrote to us that you can believe this is true because this has been our experience. We believe because these people were mocked and thrown into prison and tortured and killed and stoned and beheaded and exiled because they believed in it. Now for one person to do that, that's crazy. For all of them to do that, that's incredible. Some of One person might die for a lie, but why would all of them do it? Unless it was true, and unless they had experienced something called life, something called a new way to live, that no matter what pressures come on you, no matter what pressures face you, that you can live free from all of that stuff. That's why it's important. That's why they want us to know about the resurrection because they want us to have some of this everlasting life. And as we wrap up this morning, we're going to come straight back to the thing we said at the beginning. Every day, everybody has an invitation to believe something. Every day, we have an invitation to believe. You don't have to believe what they're saying. There's a lot of evidence. They all are saying the same thing. There's a lot of experience. They've all experienced the same thing. But at some point, it becomes personal. And you have to choose to believe or not. And I'd like to invite you to make a decision today to believe that Jesus was who he said he was. He said, I'm the Son of God. I've come to give you life and life to the full. John 10.10. That guy John again, that stuff life again. The invitation for you today to experience life to the full that Jesus came to give us. And we're going to put a prayer up on the screen. I'm just going to pray it. We can pray it together. Maybe this will be the first time you've prayed it. And maybe you don't want, maybe you're not ready to pray this today and that's okay. But at some point, it will become a personal decision for you. And here's this prayer, and I'd like to invite you just to pray with me. It says, God, thank you that you love me and you want me to experience fullness of life. To show me this, you sent your son, Jesus, to earth. Today, I respond to the invitation to believe in the resurrected Jesus. Today, I respond to the invitation to believe in the resurrected Jesus. You know, if you've, if you've prayed that today, and it was the first time that you've prayed that, would love to speak to you, would love to journey with you, love to chat with you. If you're with us online and this was the first time that you've prayed this, you can go to uh, our website and you can actually follow a link that you can let us know that you've prayed that prayer. There's also a card, a little piece of paper on one of the chairs. And if, you've, if you're a visitor or if this is your first time that you've prayed that prayer and you want us to know that, please fill that out. Alternatively, if you came with some friends today or if you've got somebody in your family that you trust, just tell them. Let them know. Tell them that you prayed this prayer today for the first time. And we would absolutely love to journey with you. We would love to walk with you wherever you are. Because if you're a doubter or a skeptic or an unbeliever, welcome to the club. You're in the best possible place because every single one of us were also doubters, skeptics, and unbelievers at some point in our lives. And it's great to be together. Have a wonderful, amazing rest of the day. We've got some cakes at the back. Our youth have come in. They've set up some stuff at the cake stall. Feel free to grab some cake and uh, pay some money. Um, If you've got children or youth and you need to collect them, please do so. Then you can bring them back here. We'll be hanging out. Have an awesome, awesome rest of the day. Thank you very much. (laughs) 